so that ourselves can get comfortable in our seats. We're really tight. Okay, so welcome to you all in this first panel. Uh, it's always difficult to be the first opening panel of the day, so uh, we need to get everybody warmed up, but we've got plenty of interesting things to discuss, so I think we'll, uh, it'll be a good start to the day. Um, now, we've heard that translation is all about meeting the other, um, and in this session we're going to be talking about how, see how translation enables accessibility in all its forms. For example, as we saw in the poll just now, uh, the provision of translation enables access to information, very important, and services, and that's for everyone, um, whether it be in education or healthcare, public administration, news or culture. And it's an especially, especially important um, because migration, as we know, in Europe is increasing and we're seeing increasing numbers of migrants. And of course that means we've got more people in our countries who are speaking different languages than we've had before. And that also increases the need to have more unusual language pairings, which perhaps we've never had before. Uh, then, on the other hand, we have technology that is helping the work of translators themselves um, and making it easier for translations with sp uh, translators with specific needs to do their jobs and thus opening up the accessibility in the profession. Um, and then, of course, accessibility also, accessibility also includes aspects, as we heard from the Commissioner yesterday, things like plain and clear language, um, accessible technical communication, sign language, as we have behind me, interlingual re-speaking and interlingual written re-speaking. So there are accessibility Accessibility covers a huge amount of topics. We're not going to be able to cover them all in our uh, 70 minutes that we have now, but we're going to try and cover as many of them as possible. Um, we've got four experts, and they're going to pass on their insights of the various uh, perspectives. I'm going to give them a brief introduction, uh, and you can see the rest of their biographies on the TEF platform. So on stage, we have Bogdan Mitrofan, who's been working in the translation business for six 16 years, with a vast majority of his output relating to European affairs and EU institutions. As you can no doubt appreciate, his physical ability has made his job very challenging, but not impossible. Fred Bain uh, is Senior Data Scientist at TransPerfect, and he'll be outlining progress made in providing healthcare that is more accessible, and work on recognising regional dialects and speech impediments, uh, among many other things, all thanks to new technology. Then we have Birgit Grubel, uh, who works as an interlingual live subtitler and subtitling editor for the deaf and hard of hearing at the Austrian Broadcasting Corporation, ORF. And last but not least, sitting next to me, I have Benjamin Poor, who is anything but poor. He is at the European Broadcasting Union, uh, and he works as a project manager on U Eurovox, which we're going to be hearing about a little bit later. So give our speakers a big round of encouragement with a nice round of applause. Just a reminder, interpretation is available should you need it. Um, we, as far as I know, everyone's going to be speaking in English, but if you need it, the numbers uh, are issued there on the signs in the screen and also online as well. So the next 70 minutes, uh, we're going to be jam-packed, as I said. We're going to have some opening remarks from the speakers. Uh, I think you've probably gathered, I like my polls, so we're going to be having plenty of those dotted through, like yesterday's opening uh, uh, plenary session. Um, I'd like, there will be a chance for questions too, so please do send them in on Slido. Please upvote them uh, so that we'll be going to the ones with the most votes first. And we'll see if anyone has the courage to ask a question from the room as well. That would be nice. Uh, I'll try and get as many questions in as possible. So to set the scene for our first speaker, uh, I'd like to la launch our first poll for this uh, session. 
Uh, and so uh, that's how you can join Slido for those of you in the room. Um, uh, online, you've got it there already next to the, the screen. And in this one, uh, what I'm asking is, for which of the following actions do you most commonly use keyboard shortcuts? Um, and we'd like you to rank your answers. Um, so we'll see what they say. Uh, I'm going to leave the voting open for a bit, but I'm going to start by talking about accessibility in some of its many forms with Bogdan Mitrofan. Now, while people are voting, can you just tell us a little bit about your background, about how you got into translation, um, and just give us a bit of a perspective on how you got involved in the industry? Thank you very much for inviting me here. I'm very happy to be here. Also not so happy to be the first to break the ice here <laughs> in this panel. Uh, yes, I've started somewhere in 2006 when Romania was, making, was taking uh, its final steps to join the European Union. There were some uh, red flags that Romania had to deal with regarding the rule of law, uh, the institutional organization and the human rights. And this is how I first took my first contact with what European Union was going to be. Well, yes, before that, uh, 22 years ago, I had a diving accident that brought me into a wheelchair. Um, things were kind of tough at, uh, at the beginning. There were no uh, uh, CAT tools that we are using extensively today. But um, uh, the... Um, Computer science and technology helped me a lot all through these years, and from, uh, the output uh, also increased uh, with time. Well, um, you can tell us a little bit more about how technology has helped you, and also how you have seen technology develop, and how its developments have also helped you in your work. But I, what I'd like to do is now close our poll, please, and um, let's just see the results here. We've got, okay, uh, the most common, uh, uh, interesting to see the most <laughs> common ones are copy, cut, and paste. It's not then a surprise. save, yes. yes. Um, highlighting or selecting text, not so many people doing that. Moving around a document, mm -hmm. and then other. Uh, and I, obviously there are very few people who say, what are keyboard shortcuts? Good, well that's uh, good to know. Because obviously for ourselves as well, you know, ergonomically, and uh, it can certainly help you know, reduce some of your use of the mouse. What do you think about the results? Yes, of thinking about uh, shortcuts, my disability and impaired hands, um, make it a bit uh, problematic with me to use combination of keys. And I, was, I discovered such a feature in Windows, which is also present in uh, Mac and Linux also, uh, which is called Sticky Keys. I don't know if you already tried it already. Uh, you may try it by, by striking any shift key for five times, and it lets the user um, uh, use such combinations instead of uh, uh, pressing two or three keyboards uh, keys at the same time. It lets uh, uh, the user press a modifier key like Control or Shift, and then the other keys uh, sequence sequentially and not simultaneously. And this is how it's helping. It's helpful for me and for disabled people like uh, or uh, single-handed. Because when I use the computer, uh, I use uh, my mouse with both hands and the keyboard with one hand. For you, it's the opposite way, exactly. Mm. Um, and then, of course, uh, when I first began translating in 2006, uh, I, already, I only could work on Microsoft Word. And I do remember somewhere in 2010 I discovered my first CAT tool, which was, I think, Trados Workbench. And then, of course, uh, the CAT tools got more and more advanced and now are full of functionalities. And um, I think the major breakthrough in this is the introduction of machine translation, which, has, which is now embedded in, uh, in the software and it is, uh, reduces... Uh, it speeds up the uh, translation process and also um, ensures consistency because um, the translator has uh, to work on 
the results of the machine translation, and they only have to adapt or post edit the the results of the machine translation, which is good for me because I'm no longer have to uh, type endless sequences of, qu of sentences. And perhaps yesterday we were talking about, um, let's say, innovations in dictating, uh, and that would be obviously a big help for you as well, I'm sure, in dictating. Yes, I thought that would, that would be good, but now with the introduction of machine translation, practically you have all the text at your disposal, and there's no need to, to use uh, speech-to-text. But indeed, there are people with disabilities who cannot use... Uh, cannot control their hands at all, and for them, such software like Dragon, naturally speaking, and others, are uh, essential in their activity. Well, it might be interesting to check out our se morning se uh, our session yesterday because we were talking quite a lot about uh, dictating it and particularly the use of it for um, post uh, post machine translation editing. So it, that might be useful for you. I would check it out. Um, and uh, we also have our speakers from yesterday. You could organise a one-to-one -one platform meeting with them as well to discuss and find out more. Thank you for sharing that. That's very interesting. And it's not just about the software either. It's also the hardware. Uh, I remember you telling me about problems with the keyboards in the early days. Yes. We all know that 10, 20 years ago, the, the keyboards were very stiff and hard. And for me, with impaired hands, it was a problem. I do remember my beginning sense as a user of a translator that I used a a plastic extension on my index finger uh, that I no longer use now because some progress in my physical uh, um, health has improved with time. Thank you for sharing this uh, with us. And talking about continual developments to help translators with specific needs, um, uh, we, uh, we talked about uh, dictating uh, text. If anyone has any um, questions for Bogdan or any of our other panellists, please do send them in on Slido and upvote them too. Now we're going to hear about uh, technology enabling accessibility from the perspective of someone who's involved in researching and developing it, Fred Bain. For example, he's worked on projects to develop ways to recognise regional dialects, which is actually a big problem, um, and also help people with speakers with lower educational levels, uh, speech impediments, and even sufferers of Parkinson's. Um, Fred, can you tell us more about this work and also the importance of multilingual translation models? Sure. Um, first of all, thanks for having me on the panel today. So I, I feel like machine translation intersects with accessibility in healthcare in a couple of ways. Um, two of them, which I'll start with, are sort of macro level trends within the industry of machine translation. And then I'll circle back to some things that talk about accessibility in particular. So two of the macro trends that are driving this right now um, are support for a growing number of language communities, both in number and in diversity. Um, and this is driven by increased data availability, as well as a more efficient use of the data that we do have. So in the last five years, we've seen an explosion of publicly available open source data uh, designed for use in translation models that covers hundreds of languages, which was a resource that was just not available uh, before that. And that enables us to support a growing number of languages. For example, Microsoft Translator has recently re released Faroese and some other uh, minority languages, which I, I think is a, a great advancement. These languages were kind of ignored because of a lack of data up until now, and now those languages are increasingly supported. And uh, a parallel trend with this is more efficient use of data that we have. So the the fact that uh, Faroese can now be supported with machine translation is due to the fact that we can train models that work well with ever smaller amounts of data. And uh, this, this enables greater uh, diversity in the language models themselves. Um, so uh, 
how this relates to accessibility in one way talks, uh, uh, speaks to your point about the regional dialects. Um, previous data sets, uh, and in fact most data sets still today, uh, lump all varieties of languages together. And speakers of German will know that German from Germany and Austria and Switzerland uh, share significant differences both in, in grammar and in, in, in the word choice uh, and in the accent of pronunciation as well. And so uh, one of our uh, missions in TransPerfect is to be able to support uh, different regional vi uh, varieties of languages. Um, so Portuguese for Portugal, Portuguese for Brazil, Spanish for various countries in Latin America. Um, these are important advances. Then uh, multilingual models, like you mentioned. Uh, these are a recent innovation. Um, in the last couple of years, they've been increasingly competent. And one interesting thing about these multilingual models is that they uh, are capable of translation in what we call few-shot or zero-shot circumstances. And what I mean here is that there are very few or no available data for a specific language pair. But simply because of the exposure the model has to the translation task in various situations and data from lots of different languages, it's able to translate directly from, say, Korean to, say, Farsi. And I think this is important for accessibility because we no longer need to rely on English as a pivot language. Let me backtrack and say, in a few years, we will no longer need to rely <laughs> on English as a pivot language. Within TransPerfect, still for these language pairs, our pivot system performs better than multilingual. But uh, it's my expectation that within a few years, we may move to multilingual translation models, enabling these direct translation across hundreds of different language pairs. And lastly, uh, let me circle back to a few accessibility-related things, like uh, translation designed for people with different, uh, different abilities or uh, different educational levels. You mentioned interlingual respeaking or rephrasing. This is something driven by subtitle translation, but sees its application in healthcare scenarios where people may have different education levels. So taking the technical language of a medical professional and translating it into something that someone with a lower educational attainment level can understand and relate to and contextualize uh, can really spur accessibility in the public health care sector. Um, yes, so that's what I'd like to say at this time. I must say, I don't think it's necessarily people with a lower educational level in the medical profession. I mean, often they talk in a jargon that most people don't understand. Mm -hmm. So it's actually not necessarily even to do with your education level. It's mm -hmm. to make it more accessible. Right. And um, people with different medical conditions clearly may have uh, difficulties speaking, hearing, reading. And there have been uh, people in the field working on adapting these technologies for people with different ability levels. For example, there's research on speech recognition specifically for people with autism, or even using speech recognition as a diagnostic tool. Uh, I'm based in Barcelona, and I'd like to give a shout out to a local startup that is working on uh, finding biomarkers, what they call vocal biomarkers, for diagnosing Parkinson's from speech. And this is quite an interesting adaptation because not everyone thinks to go to the doctor or uh, has time or resources to uh, access medical care. Um, and so having these pre uh, predictions about possible developments in health that are uh, developed in the course of normal use of technology can help us uh, diagnose in time, apply treatment in time, and improve health outcomes. Yes, though of course that's a whole kind of different side world to where we're talking about, but it's, it's actually very interesting um, the, what you can get from speech. And I think it uh, raises an interesting question, which we, we might see quite different perspectives in the EU and the US, which is how do we collect data to train these models? So uh, AI models, they're data hungry. And while I've mentioned that we are improving our efficiency with using data, they still need vast amounts of data. And in the US, many people have a persistent distrust of government, which has led to 
private companies being the ones driving these innovations. And people might be uh, quite uncomfortable with the idea of the government having these data. Whereas my perception in Europe is that people may be more comfortable with governments handling these initiatives rather than private companies. And so uh, it's an interesting question for me. How do people feel about the use of their personal data for these things that may not benefit them directly? Or how, are, how can we equi equitably share the benefits of uh, these technical advances that are driven by personal data? Thank you, Fred. That now leads us on to our next poll, because we'd like to find out what you think about this. Uh, and the poll is about data privacy. Uh, obviously, in Europe, we have a kind of different attitude to it, to, uh, to the Americans. Uh, in fact, I think it's probably the opposite. We prefer the governments having rather than private companies. Uh, but uh, we'd like to know what you think, how comfortable or uncomfortable you would be with governments using anonymized health records to train AI models. Uh, I'm going to leave that open for a couple of moments, uh, and I'll just let you get to your sip of water, Birgit, because I wanted to come to you. Um, we're going to be hearing about uh, how you use speech recognition for subtitling on Austrian television in a minute, but mm -hmm. how would you answer that question? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Putting you on the spot here. Mm -hmm. How comfortable or uncomfortable would yeah, you be? Not too comfortable, I think. Not also too comfortable. Okay. I mean, I, yeah. I'm not going to ask you why, I'm because not, yeah. it's, it's a mm -hmm. whole long argument, mm -hmm. but okay, Fred, but, you've already mm. got one, one answer here, and we're, we're getting mm -hmm. other ones there. Um, I will mm. leave it for a, a few more minutes, um, and uh, just to ask our other... Ben, what do you think? What would you, how would you answer this? Um, I think I'd be quite comfortable. I think the key phrase there is anonymized, um, picking up on what Fred said, which is, if governments don't do it, commercial companies will. So I'd rather actually the government does it under regulation, under scrutiny, mm -hmm. with anonymized records. Mm -hmm. Bogdan? I would be quite comfortable. With, with quite that. comfortable. Yes, I'm, I'm not sure that uh, uh, private companies would do a better job than uh, uh, the governments or on, on this. Interesting. Okay, thank you. We're now going to close the poll, and we see that 39% oh, okay. of you are quite comfortable, um, but 26 are quite uncomfortable. Uh, so it's a real uh, kind of split there, uh, almost split. Yeah, interesting. Okay, well, you can talk a little bit more about that uh, in a moment, uh, if it's relevant. But, um, I, Birgit, um, we've been hearing about how machine translation can help us in our jobs. Um, but it's obviously not able to replace human beings completely. Uh, in fact, as the commissioner said yesterday, human beings can speak to the heart, whereas machines can't. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about your work and how you use machine translation um, in your subtitling work? Yes, exactly. Thanks for the introduction. I'm really honored to be here today. Yes, as you said, I'm an intralingual subtitling editor and live subtitler for deaf and hard of hearing for the Austrian television, so the Austrian Broadcasting Corporation, ORF. And we are producing prepared subtitles, lots of semi-loved subtitles, but also live subtitles. And their technology is very important for us. So live subtitling is partly intralingual um, interpreting, but just partly, because there are just parts of interpreting there, by using the technique of respeaking. So we are using respeaking. That means we are listening, and then we are reformulating, rephrasing what we hear into subtitles by using a speech recognition program, which writes down what we say, or hopefully it writes down what we say, sometimes not, then we have to correct it because mistakes are just funny if they're not on air, of course. So we have to correct it and then send it on the screen on air. And so for this, we use speech recognition. Of course, this works very well if the program is trained, so we are training a lot with the program. Um, for example, adding vocabulary, and the more you train it, the better it works, of course. But one thing is... Um, um, in, with this technique, of course, that if we use it, we have a time lag, of course, because we have to listen, you know? we can't stop the video because it's live, then we have to rephrase it you know, and correct it if there are problems and send it on the screen. So 
the time lag is um, we can't avoid uh, really the time lag, but we have some strategies to um, make so to make it better or to um, I mean to reduce the effects of the time lag maybe. So we can, for example, use different colors for different persons, uh, so it's easier to distinguish which person is talking, and you can also, for example, send parts of sentences or if. Uh, a sentence starts with in the evening, for example, you can send in the evening immediately without knowing what will be after or said afterwards. So this is possible and it's also helpfully because in subtitling and of course also in live subtitling, you have just a limited space on screen, you know, 37 characters per line. So of course it's also helpful to send some parts of sentences. Even if it's not always possible, of course, it's, if it's very stressful or if you don't someone speaking very quickly, of course, it's not always possible to have this possibility to send parts, but it's a method and if it works, it's, it's a good thing to do it, of course. Yeah, so this is the technology we use most of the time, because for most situations, for most life situations in, on TV, this is the, met the best method, I would say. But we are also using testing and using automatic speech recognition because there are situations where it can be applied. So we use it, for example, for press conferences, for some press conferences, which are just, just streamed online. So that means not on TV, because on TV we don't have um, a delay or, um, in this kind, because on, if it's streamed online, these press conferences, we have um, the stream two minutes before the public. So we have the stream two minutes before the others can see the, um, the stream and also the text of automatic recognition. So we have the text and the video two minutes before and we can correct it. You know? Because of course it has to be corrected. Yeah? It's not just completely automatic, so we have to correct the sentences. But this is a method which is useful for these press conferences when the speakers are well prepared, if they do not talk too quickly, for example. So this is in this um, kind, or for this form, it's possible. Huh? But of course not for all situations, because um, when we have to subtitle, it's always, as it has been mentioned yesterday, um, condensing, of course. Yeah, so you have, you have to condense, you reformulate, and if it's automatic, you don't have this aspect, of course. But for some situations, it's very useful, as I mentioned, for these press conferences where we can use it and correct it, and you see the difference. So if someone speaks very clearly and slowly, it, it works quite well. So it depends, yeah. And this is a really interesting or important aspect, so if someone has to speak clearly for speech recognition, this is also the same if I'm working as a re-speaker. You know, I have to speak really clearly. And also if um, it has been mentioned concerning dialects, you know, if someone is speaking or using words in dialect, which is very often the case in Austria, um, I have to reformulate this, or rephrase it, or to type it maybe. Yeah? It depends. But um, um, it is necessary to, to rephrase it in general. So that's uh, yeah, mainly the things I do for television, not only, but yeah. Interesting, yeah. What, uh, picking up on you know, the, the, the regional dialects mm -hmm. and how difficult that is. Mm -hmm. so maybe you and Fred need to be mm -hmm. talking uh, on the it's, sidelines yeah. and you mm -hmm. following some of mm -hmm. his technology. Uh, very interesting. Um, I see you've already been sending in some questions on Slido. Great, thank you. Keep them coming in uh, and keep voting uh, on the uh, questions that other people send in as well. Um, and uh, I, I'm not monitoring uh, Twitter or Instagram, but please do pass on our tips and things that you hear here to other people who are interested and not able to attend TEF uh, with the hashtag 2022TEF. Before I turn to Benjamin, uh, I'd like to launch another quick poll. Fingers at the readies, please. This time, it's not multiple choice. It's a word cloud. Uh, and we want to know where you get your language technology news from. Uh, 
I can already see some people in the room going, hmm, not sure about that. Uh, have a think. Uh, okay, social media. Uh, okay, well, well, we'll see what's coming up here. <laughs> I'm going to leave this uh, on for a little bit. Uh, colleagues uh, in Facebook. Mm -hmm. uh, translator's toolbox. Yes, this is interesting. Uh, nowhere. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, well, Ben, you'll maybe be telling us a little bit more about why it's important to have sources for your technology news. Um, uh, where do you get your news from? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, dun, 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 dun. I, I used to get my news sometimes from Twitter. That's a very unpopular thing to say now. Does anyone still use Twitter? I've kind of moved from that now, so I'm in a transitionary period. Someone let me know where I can get my news from. Um, local news sources, um, I mean, from, I'm from the EBU, so I have to say, unfortunately, that I get it from some of our members who produce some of the most trusted news content in Europe. Mm -hmm. That's my official line. Okay. And that is absolutely <laughs> true as well, actually. I'm not even <laughs> making that up. But um, yeah, I think, uh, if, if, I might, if I continue to say, I think um, where to source your news is really, really important. I think it's really interesting to see social media there because some of the research that we've done across Europe is that social media is amongst the least trusted media in Europe for some countries. I think it varies if you're going to southern Europe, but certainly it's interesting that people get their news from what is essentially quite a chaotic and untrustworthy medium. Yes, absolutely. I'm very glad to see, and it's disappeared now, but I, I saw Tef in there somewhere. Uh, and I definitely think that, obviously, if you don't do anything else, following this forum certainly helps you keep abreast uh, of some of the latest technological developments. Um, so, Benjamin, uh, I think we'll now close our poll. Thank you. Um, very interesting. LinkedIn. I mean, I think out of all of the, the uh, um, let's say, the, the social media channels, LinkedIn is perhaps slightly more... Professional. Okay, yes, professional. I was going to say Reddit, but that's, very, that's probably not very professional. <laughs> okay, well, thank you for voting, everyone. Uh, very, very interesting. But also, uh, so why do we need to be up on our technology news? Tell us, Ben. Uh, well, I mean, it's moving so quickly that it's difficult to keep up to pace with it, really. I mean, this is a room full of experts. You all ha are experts in different things, and, and uh, it's impossible for me to know every single thing that's going on. But I think it's great to just have... Oh, someone's written my husband. That's quite interesting. Um, it's really important to keep up with the, with the trends as much as you can do, really, because if we're stuck in the ways that we've always done things, then we're not advancing. We're not reaching new people. We're not doing new things. So I think it's great. It's important. It's vital to be innovative. Okay, and talking about innovation, can you tell us a little bit about Eurovox, that you are the project manager developing this? Sure. Um, well, for those who don't know, I come from the European Broadcasting Union, the EBU. It's not the European Bridge Union, if you want to search that, unless you play cards. Uh, we are the world's largest association of public service media. So what does that mean? That means um, familiar names like the BBC, Radio France, RTBF and VRT here in Brussels. Uh, Rai in Italy, RTV in Spain. So it's all the way from Portugal to Finland, I'm going to say, but also to Iceland as well. Uh, the crazy bunch of people in Iceland. Um, crazy language, sorry, I mean. Uh, I have some <laughs> notes here, which is uh, we have 112 organizations operating in 56 countries. Uh, and the interesting thing for me is that operates across 153 languages. We're based in Geneva in Switzerland, and... Um, some people don't know, I guess most of you do, I hope, that Switzerland has four official languages. Hopefully no one's going to correct me here. One of those being Romance, which is spoken by about 30 to 40,000 people. Uh, suffice to say, that is not a language that's offered on the large commercial transcription and translation platforms. So one of our roles really is to um, help our members with sharing content. Our members produce... Uh, should we say, I'm biased, the best news content in Europe, if not the world, uh, some of the best information, the best cultural information. Uh, they do this in their own official languages. Uh, what we really want to help them to do is to share that amongst themselves, amongst their citizens. One of, our, one of the organizations that came from the EBU is Eurovision. Now, it's not just the song contest, although that is fantastic, uh, but it's a content sharing network. It's about sharing events, news, conferences. It's a bit like what happens here in the European Commission, where multilingual content is shared widely amongst a number of different languages. So really, this, this speaks to the heart of what we want to do, which is how do we help our members share their content more widely? One of the key parts of Eurovision is uh, a news exchange, and that's taking news from all of our members, making it available to the rest of our membership. And language there is, of course, a barrier, because 
it's all very well known what's happening in your own country, in your own language, but what's happening in the rest of Europe? Now, for those who didn't guess, I'm from the UK, and I always think to myself, what would have happened in 2016 in the Brexit vote if we would have had more information from across Europe, if we would have had more of a view on what's happening, more of a European perspective. And that's a very kludgy link to a project that we have in the EBU now, which is called the European Perspective. So what we do there is we take in news content from across our membership, that's up to 3,000 news articles and media elements every single day from across the EBU membership, translate that, trans well, transcribe the media content, translate the articles and the media content to a range of different languages, and that can be any language that our members use. And that includes, for instance, uh, Ukrainian from our colleagues in Suspin, Susplint, I'm gonna say that wrong, sorry, our Ukrainian colleagues. Um, we take their news content, and that is translated to all of our member languages. So that means that all the countries across Europe can have Ukrainian news content translated to their own language and published on their own websites. And there are a, a reasonable number now of our members that have that on the front page of their websites. News content that comes from somewhere else has been translated into their native language and is available to uh, citizens. Um, that's been enabled by a project that I'm the product owner of. Uh, I don't actually do any development. That's a polite way of saying that. I have a team to do that called Eurovox. And it's a toolbox for transcribing and translating. What we do simply is we lower the barrier to be able to use a range of different language tools and technologies. So the big commercial platforms, uh, the middle tier, should we say, European-focused platforms, but specialists as well. So I talked about Iceland. There's, uh, for instance, I'm hopefully going to be having a conversation soon with a commercial company in Iceland uh, that specializes in Icelandic transcriptions. Or one of our members, RTR in Switzerland, has developed their own romance transcription and translation technologies. So my job is to plug that into this toolbox, which is then made available to all of our members. So any one of our members can then access that, that technology and target that community. So it's really all around breaking down barriers. Lucky your members, what, is it ever going to be available wider than your members? Uh, we hope so. I mean, my main focus is working for our members, but obviously our members work for their national audiences. So it really reaches beyond that. But what we want to do is we want to make the core part of the system open source, so make that available to the world um, and see what we can do about the other tools and services that we built up around that. But obviously this is not something just for public service media broadcasters. This could be really useful for other broadcasters as well. Why not make commercial news content available in different languages? If it's trusted and it's verified, and that's the important thing, this is not a fully automated system, this has journalists at the heart of it. We use AI tools, but also it's super important to actually have the experts, uh, the journalists, the content producers, correcting it, using it as an assistive way, but then, um, put, should we say, putting a green light onto that and saying, yes, this is good enough to be used. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Thank you. Uh, so um, you need to be monitoring your technology news to find out when this open source version is perhaps available, etc. Thank you. Um, I want to go back to you, uh, Brigitte, uh, a moment, um, because we were talking about live subtitling. Um, and I think it's interesting because that is obviously slightly different um, to speech-to-text interpreting uh, and also to interlingual re-speaking. Um, so before we come to audience questions, I thought I'd like to just talk a little bit about, about that. And then I know, Fred, you've got some things to add after that as well. Yes, exactly. Exactly. It's important to mention it because it's similar to speech-to-text interpreting, but not the same. Yeah. So speech-to-text interpreting is used in other situations, for example, for conferences, for hard of hearing also and for meetings you know, for example and uh, speech to text interpreters can also use the technique of respeaking so sometimes they are using respeaking but sometimes they also use um, the traditional method where they are typing so they learn to type very fast there are different systems and it's of course another method which is hard to learn no? because you have to learn also systems for use shortcuts for example so for speech-to-text interpreting, there are two methods, typing and respeaking. So you could also use it on TV, the method of typing, but most TV stations use respeaking. It's, of course, also depending on the language, but um, because, for example, if you have studied interpreting, it's easier to, to learn, of course, respeaking than the typing method. But if you are in a conference, 
And um, for example, it's, um, often um, typing is the best method, so speech to text interpreting is another setting, uh, and um, or many other settings, of course. Uh, so that's the differentiation, uh, the difference. But um, of course, it's similar. Uh, mm -hmm. Another technique. And Fred, would um, can you tell us about inter uh, intra language simplification in subtitle translation? Mm -hmm. Yes, so um, as was mentioned earlier, subtitling is um, a, a quite specific uh, area of, of, of language technology and it brings its own requirements and um, these can be quite difficult for automated processes. Um, for example, you mentioned a 37 character per line limit and, and this can be quite difficult um, when a speaker is quite verbose or when you have a language that takes up a lot of space. Um, for example, working in Chinese, you might find that everything condenses quite nicely into a single line. But we're working with German with longer words or Finnish with longer words. Uh, you have to become quite creative. And uh, one tool that's commonly used in this situation is sort of a two-step process. One where you first do intralingual uh, simplification of the text and then from there translate into other languages um, and during that translation process you can also impose some constraints on you know the length of the output um, but this is this is becoming an increasingly important step in uh, automatic subtitle translation and uh, it, it's quite interesting um, I mentioned earlier multilingual models uh, it's been found that asking a multilingual model to translate from English into English or from any other language into itself will often pr pr provide a, a reasonable paraphrase of the original input text. And if you additionally impose length constraints, you can come out on the other end with a reasonable simplification uh, of the original input text, which then is more suited for translation into other languages for use in subtitles. Very interesting. Hmm. Thank you. Okay, well, I think I would like to go to your questions now. Uh, now, there are a lot of them, and I've said I'm going to go to the ones with the first vote, uh, with the highest votes first, but actually I'm not going to do that. Uh, sorry about that, but I would like, because I, w I want to come to Bogdan, because uh, we've not heard from him for a while, and there were some questions specifically for okay. you. Um, so there's one from Adrian, and he says, how do you deal with the very tedious keyboard mouse intensive tasks such as cleaning up TMs, etc.? Well, that would not be a problem with um, TMs in my work, because um, uh, as I said, I work for European institutions, and for five years now, they have been sending pre-translated packages they, they are, and they, all, they contain already they already contain TMs, uh, term bases um, so there's no need for me to do, to do, to do that or we can create a term uh, a translation memory from scratch or use um, um, other um, resources we have locally on our, on our computer. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. And one more for you. Uh, according to you, are people aware of accessibility themes in translation or do they tend to take them for granted? Well, it depends on the level of disability here on the problem. Because for me, I can use my hands and fingers to some extent, but, but there are also people that are completely disabled regarding their hands. And here they can only rely on um, uh, speech, to t speech to text and voice control software. Okay, thank you. Um, right, let's go to the next question. This time I will go to the one with the highest votes because we've had 46 people voting for this one, uh, which was from Dallas Hopkins. And it says, as a translator, why should I want to offer my own translated work to help develop AI-powered machine translation systems? 
right? <laughs> For example? I'm not sure that you would, um, <laughs> to, be, to be honest. Um, as an individual translator, you, you may benefit from uh, keeping your own translation memories locally, uh, developing your own term bases, and, and these can be used to help improve your productivity. But in terms of submitting your own uh, original work content so someone else can leverage it and profit off of it, I, I, I don't see much um, impetus to do that. Uh, as a translator, stepping back a bit, as a translator, uh, a former translator myself, I certainly benefited a lot from advancements in machine, technolo machine translation technology. I started my um, career before moving into the data science field. I was a Chinese to English translator for clinical trials. And when I started, machine translation was completely laughably unusable. And uh, over time, it developed to, into a useful tool, to a very useful tool, to, my gosh, that's good. And um, uh, as a translator, I benefited immensely from that, though I did not contribute in any way to that development. And so uh, th there was no motivation for me as an individual to contribute my work product to this, but I certainly benefited from it. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm looking at, there's a couple of Slido questions that are very interesting, but anyone in the room have a question? Uh -huh. Okay, we have a hand over there. I'll go to this one, and then when I come back to hands in the room, I'll come back to you in a moment. Please remember that our definition of question is... Maximum two sentences with a question mark at the end. Thank you. I'm uh, Sabine Hanul from the University of Antwerp. Um, this panel is about accessibility in many forms, but I've been missing one important form, which is audio description. Um, so I would just uh, mention this. And then I have uh, one important uh, question to the people, to the four panel uh, members. Uh, does someone of you uh, involve the target public of accessibility in your jobs or in your research because it is very important to, imp to involve them directly? Thank you. Obviously, thank you. Uh, audio description. Uh, we'd be, we, we, we were going to get to audio description. We've not covered it yet. Mm -hmm. Birgit? Yeah. Thanks for this question. Yeah, I wanted to mention it. Um, of course, um, in Austrian GB, we have other, um, ex um, other forms of accessibility, of course, of access services. There is also sign language interpreting for some programs. There is um, easy language, um, news in easy language, and also audio description. Yeah? Um, we don't do that ourselves, so there are, we have other companies who do that for us. And, but um, two colleagues of mine um, um, developed an, an editor for audio description, so you can write um, in this editor the, the audio description, for example, and um, then we use for some programs um, a synthetic voice. So in this editor you have the text, the authors write, and then a synthetic voice um, is rendering the text. It's not used for every situation, of course, and there's also live audio description, but for some situations um, we started to use it, and we um, are proofreading the scripts, for example, proofreading and sometimes adapting the voice. So if something isn't pronounced well, so we have to correct it or yeah, make corrections because um, um, if, if there is something which has to be changed. Sometimes also together with, um, the, with the editorial who has made the program, so there's also a cooperation. I haven't done it really by myself, but I will start now in November doing this and also proofreading the, scrip the scripts. But of course, there's also audio description, so yes. Thank you, I hope that answered that. And uh, Fred? Yeah. Um, this is not my direct area of research, but in terms of automated translation, uh, there have been recent advancements in what we call multimodal translation models where you can take in, for example, an image or a video and produce text on the other end, which is a caption for the image or a description of what's going on in the video. Coupled with text-to-speech, this provides uh, a potential pipeline for m increasing audio description support in, in these media contexts. 
Okay, thank you. And talking about the, tar um, the target public, are they involved? We had this discussion yesterday about thinking about the end user. Um, first of all, I'd like to ask you, Bogdan, have you ever been involved in any development of software or even hardware um, that can help tr tr translate us with the accessibility issues? Uh, no, I'm only a beneficiary of uh, technology as well my colleagues are facilitators of technology. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Uh, Benjamin, I mean, from your point of view, um, is there any sort of backwards and forwards in understanding the target public? Um, I think there has to be. Um, should we say my role currently doesn't necessarily do that, but I think uh, I would certainly say that whenever technology is produced that has to serve some purpose, that has to fulfill a use case, so the way you do that is go to the user. So, I mean, in my own case, uh, for, uh, for having tools to eventually then be able to provide uh, non-native speakers news content, um, the, the proof of the pudding, as we say, is are people actually consuming that? Are people reading that and it's in, in the language that we're translating it to? So as part of the work that's being done, we've certainly added on top of that analytics on is anyone actually looking at this? Is anyone engaging with this multilingual are they? content? And they are in, in, in millions, in tens of millions of click-throughs. So it's hugely popular. I, I, absolutely, I agree. If you have, a, if you have an assumption... Test it. Test it to see if people actually use it. And while you've got the microphone, there was a question on, uh, on Slido for you, uh, sent in from Anonymous with 21 votes, but a uh, very interesting question. Difficult. Um, can you tell us a bit more about how Eurovox combats the dif dissemination of fake news? Oh, that's a good question. And uh, nice to hear from you again, Anonymous. Um, so I think... Eurovox itself, itself doesn't combat fake news. It's, it's a kind of a, um, a dumb actor in that respect. It, it provides the capabilities to do transcription and translation. Really, the combating comes from, and I mentioned this earlier, in having journalists and experts in, in the loop. So we are working on already written news content. Um, I think there's a, there's a general principle in public service media that it's, um, it's verified, it's trusted, but obviously there is someone at the other end that's then responsible for publishing that on another member's website, which says, well, actually, does this work for me? Is this, uh, what, is this the message that corresponds with what I'm doing locally? So there's always a journalist there saying, is this journalistically coherent with what I'm trying to say? So that's kind of a long answer, really diplomatic, to say there's always a human at the other end. <laughs> Okay, well, as we heard, the human factor is very important uh, in all of this. Right, let's go back to some more Slido questions, and then I'll be coming back to the gentleman who put his hand up over there, who I signal in a moment, in a moment. Uh, right, we have, um, we have a couple of questions for you, Birgit. Um, one is, do you correct subtitles yourself while re-speaking, or is there another person involved? And the, how many people are there in the live subtitling team? Yeah, thanks for this question. Yeah, we are correcting ourselves. So um, we are correcting um, what we, yeah, we re read, what we have said, and what the speech recognition has written down. We correct it and then send it on air. Yeah? That's different to speech-to-text interpreting because most of the time in speech-to-text interpreting, there's a second person correcting it. But for TB, we work... Um, so we correct ourselves, but we are always two persons, or nearly always two persons, of course, two live subtitles in a team, and we have to change after some time. So if it's really completely live and not semi-live, we change after 20 to 30 minutes, like in interpreting. So, of course, and of course, they can also um, always raise uh, technical problems or issues, so there has to be a second person who um, can... Um, we has to be there and, and help if there's a problem. So we are always two persons and um, we change if necessary. Okay, we've got another question for you, but I'm going to come to that in a minute because I'm going to come to the gentleman that I, uh, I promised I would come back to. Please give us your question. You need to switch on your microphone. Now is the time? Okay. <laughs> Hello, my name is Martin Feder. I work for the European Parliament and... Uh, uh, I'm in charge of, the, of a unit that's called speech-to-text. Actually, we have a speech-to-text unit. And I was wondering, because, you know, uh, and it's, bit, it's been bothering me since yesterday, um, you talk about things that are for entertainment. 
So, you know, subtitles and closed captions and all that stuff. But what if we sort of turn it around a little bit and say, uh, we don't care about the image, we care about the message. And this is what we are tasked with. We, we, we are supposed to transcribe, transcribe um, parliamentary debates. And I'm, and I'm really using this word on purpose, transcribe, not closed caption, not, clo not subtitle. Transcribe. In real time. With the image or without the image. I mean, what's, what's your take on this? Because uh, I think um, for our uh, sort of institutional context, the, the image or the entertainment part is not that important, but the message is more important. Of course. Thank you. Um, I'd like, also like to hear your point of view on that, Bijit. Yes, of course. Yeah, it, it, it's a different situation, of course. Um, it's, it's more speech-to-text interpreting, more transcribing. And for the TV, it's, it's different because it's subtitling. So there, there are, of course, um, yeah, um, different challenges. Yeah, and it's a different situation. Yeah, you're right. But I talked about subtitling on TV where you have the image and um, it's a different, just a different situation, I would say, of course. Yeah, and we have... To, to make the difference between these settings, of course. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and we are fully yeah. automatic. We, we don't have yeah. any human intervention. Okay. Interesting. That almost sounds a bit risky to me. I don't know. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and particularly given the importance of the debates and, and getting everything completely accurate. Benjamin? I was yet to follow up on that. That's really interesting. I'd love to have a chat with you after, but the VAFTAs about that. I mean, um, fully automated without any corrections. Uh, people do do it. There's one of our members, NPO, in the Netherlands that does fully automated transcription and captioning. I'm hoping I'm getting that right. Uh, for their politics channel, I believe. And that was something done quite early. That was a surprise to many. Um, I guess... I'd be really interested to know what happens with the translation when you're doing fully automated. Who, is there anyone verifying that? Is there an oversight? We have a machine translation component as well. And if that goes wrong? Uh, well. <laughs> <laughs> no big deal, it's right? It's machine translation, you know. We have a disclaimer. Okay, yes. That's an important, no, that's an important thing, actually. Label that to say, this is being done by an AI. Because I said it's fully automatic, we also use automatic speech recognition, but I couldn't imagine using it without correcting. I mean, because there are sometimes mistakes um, which have to be corrected. So, um, it, yeah. Um, yes, I, I'm say. actually incredibly surprised because given the, sensitive, the potential sensitivity uh, of, of what's being discussed in you know, Parliament and the importance of language and the understanding... Uh, I mean, yes, obviously the images aren't that important, but it's the understanding. Uh, anyway, um, interesting, interesting. Thank you for asking your question. Uh, and uh, I'm sure, yes, meet up with uh, Benjamin later and you can uh, talk more about that. You could even do a one-to-one -one meeting on our platform. There you are. Uh, or in person, who knows. But uh, if you want to do it uh, online, that's available too. Okay, let's go and see some more questions. Uh, and maybe I have a chance also for one more question from the room. I see someone who just caught my eye over there, that lady. I'll come to you in a minute. Uh, we'll take one more question online and then I'll come back to you. I'm afraid I've taken the woman behind you. Um, if we've got a chance, I'll come back to you. Uh, right, well, let's go back to, we've got another anonymous here. Gosh, anonymous is being busy today. Um, and it's Birgit from a translation perspective. How do you deal with humor in live subtitling when the humorous effect is related to the sounds? Yeah, this is always um, difficult. So you have um, to um, make some commentary, for example, yeah, in parentheses. You can say it's, it's humor or it's ironic, for example. You have to add something because sometimes it's difficult. Yeah? If you just read it, it's, uh, of course, um, another thing and it's difficult. So you have to add um, um, commentaries, for example. But this can be hard. Um, and if it's live, if it's semi-live, you have some time to think about it yeah, and, and to find a good solution. Sometimes if it's live, it's not possible to render it. We try, yeah, but sometimes it's not possible. This can be a problem if, um, if they talk about it later again, for example. Yeah, if, if you don't um, 
if you miss something or if you don't know um, how to deal with it yeah, and later it comes again. So it's, uh, it's a problem, of course. And also if, um, yeah, if you miss something and um, yeah, but this is, this is always the issue if it's live, for example. Yeah. But if it's possible, we make some commentary, describe what is happening. For example, you can also describe it um, because um, the public or the clients are used to it. So to describe some things, also sounds, yeah, we have to describe it. So um, try the best. Okay, thank you. Um, I've got another question for Bogdan, um, which kind of relates to what we were talking about before. Um, it's the, the question from our very busy anonymous is, are you finding that machine translation is helpful for all the texts you are translating, or are there some situations in which you choose to discard the machine translation suggestion? Yes, and st starting from uh, the question to Bridget about humor, Yes, and uh, machine translation is used for low tire content uh, because um, it is not fully equipped at this moment to capture, uh, let's say, um, fully embedded language, cultural phrases like play upon words, and that could be a, a problem for for the machine translation to machine translation to to capture this, which is in fact a good thing, because we, uh, in fact, we are glad and happy with all this uh, advancement in machine translation, but I don't think we want it to replace the human translator. <laughs> Uh, certainly not. But then again, the, you use a lot of European institutional... Uh, do, do a lot, so I imagine there's not quite so much humour in there that you have to... Yes. <laughs> no. Um, when I g got the machine translation results in, in uh, the column, uh, um, some, some time you, you tend to take for granted what you receive. But other, other times you need to reformulate everything um, and discard indeed what you receive from machine translation. It depends on on the specific type of the, of the document. If it is uh, more linear or repetitive, uh, it is good. But if uh, the content is uh, more technical or more culturally embedded, that would be a difficult task, and you need to reformulate it entirely. Okay, thank you. We're almost, well, we've still got 10 minutes left. I'm going to come to our question in the room in a second. But what I would like to do is uh, I'd like to launch a final poll, um, which we're going to leave running for a while while we do the last few questions. Uh, and the poll is, which of the following things should be done to improve accessibility? And here we'd like you to rank uh, the options. So you have more language options pairings, greater coverage of regional dialects, more software functionalities for disabled translators, improve hardware, and more subtitling or audio descriptions. Uh, so we'll leave that running. And uh, now I'd like to come to our lady in the room. Uh, please switch on your microphone and okay, go ahead. Thank you. My name is Clara, and I'm from University of Osijek. So my question is for Birgit. Uh, you mentioned two uh, techniques, re-speaking and typing. So when it comes to typing, are stenotypes machines being used or key regular keyboards? And if not, would it make sense to move stenograph uh, stenographs to other fields outside of courthouses? Thank you. Yeah, it depends. There are different keyboards used. Yeah? It also depends on the language. Um, but we don't use it for GB because we just work with um, re-speaking. So I um, didn't learn to, to type fast. So I, of course I'm fast because I'm used to it and using it, but not like speech-to-text interpreters who are using this technique. So it depends on the language. But there are different methods. Yeah? And there's also well type, but you need, of course, more time to use these keyboards. And, and, um, but there are... For example, postgraduates where can learn uh, speech to text interpreting with uh, the keyboard and training it yeah? because it takes a lot of time, of course, to learn this. Yeah. You have but, to add on that? You were, you were nodding intensely, and I thought you were good. <laughs> very strongly agreeing. Okay, very strongly agreeing. That's all right. <laughs> 
Okay, um, we're going to leave the poll going, uh, but I would like to, uh, I've got time for one more question maybe, depending on uh, how many things uh, how we have to answer it. Um, so let's have a look. Ah, now this is an interesting one. Ha, 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 ha. Right, um, from our friend Anonymous, uh, 41 people like this. Should there be a legal obligation for, countries to ex uh, for companies to explicitly ask translators for permission to repurpose their translation for non-human use? In other words, AI. That's definitely for you, Fred. Um, let me venture far outside my comfort zone into the legal realm and say that to the best of my knowledge, such a requirement exists already. Um, as a translation company, in our agreements with translators and with companies, we provide an option to use the data or not, and um, people who object to their data being used have the right to exclude it from any data sets. Um, though, please contact TransPerfect Legal for more information. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much indeed. Uh, and I, we actually have a question for the person who asked a question, um, which has now disappeared. Um, oh, yes, uh, which was from Eva Maria. Um, I'm not going to ask you to answer it, uh, but I just thought I'd like to put it to you because I think it's quite interesting. We were talking about involving the end users um, before, and so it says, what about the quality of fully automated speech recognition in the European Parliament? Has this ever been evaluated? Um, uh, so that's an interesting thing. Has it been evaluated? Do you want to quickly ask? Answer? It's to you, yes. You're looking very surprised. <laughs> I, I European it, Parliament. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> I'll ask it again. Yeah. Um, so what about the quality of fully automated speech recognition in the European Parliament? Has well, this ever been evaluated? Yes, we evaluate it on a regular basis because we, we, we have to have to meet certain benchmarks. And um, the quality of the speech recognition on the whole, I think we, we can say it's very good, very good. Uh, if you, but, but then you have this cascading problem into MT, you know. And, uh, and uh, if, if there is something wrong with ASR, then it sort of is co compounded in, in MT. But on the whole, I mean, we're extremely pleased with ASR. And what comes next with MT, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a consequence of what we have it. And I ASR. just have a question for you. You say it is evaluated. Are the final users involved in that evaluation? Uh, we have we 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 focus on linguistic quality primarily. So, mm -hmm. but yeah, we have this accessibility. That's why we're here today. Uh, we have this accessibility uh, thing on my, on our mind as well. So, uh, but our sort of primary goal was to to focus on the linguistic quality and then add progressively accessibility features, both in terms of uh, IT and sort of... Uh, also, perhaps clear yeah, speech user and plain speaking. Uh, yeah. That is perhaps... Uh, but uh, our primary goal was to, to focus on, on linguistic quality. Thank you. Okay. Uh, it's quite unusual to have a discussion with someone in the audience, but I thought it was, because it was very interesting and uh, it was a relevant question. So thank you for being our sort of... Uh, non-panelist panelist as well. That's much appreciated. Uh, okay, we have uh, very few minutes left. So um, I think well, I'll, I'll take the last question, which kind of rounds us off to almost where we started, uh, which is what are the most efficient keyboard shortcuts? Okay, now efficient is difficult to say because it depends on how you view efficiency. I would say what's your favorite keyboard shortcut? Um, so from our panelists, any, Bogdan, your favorite keyboard shortcut? Maybe the first, the, the most important is the save. <laughs> you don't want to lose uh, your work if it's a power blackout or something. Maybe the control S is uh, um, the most efficient and, and widely used for me. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, Fred? 
Um, I'll give a shout out to an underrepresented keyboard shortcut on Windows Alt Tab to switch between program windows uh, Command Tab on Mac. And Control Alt Delete. Yeah, <laughs> for when my computer crashes like every day. Yes. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Let's not defame any software here. Thank you. <laughs> Brigitte? Um, I would also say save as because if you forget or, yeah, and, and you lose some subtitles and you have stress, so it's a problem. So save as for me. I also think it's the most important shortcut. Yeah. <laughs> In fact, it's funny. I was working on a shared document on an online platform. And of course, it's all automatically saved. And I'm going continually control S, control S, and it's doing absolutely nothing. And I'm getting more and more anxious. You know, and then I'm, you know, so it takes time to realize that it, you have to trust the machine that it is being. I don't trust them, but anyway, I still go ahead with my control. That gives you a sense of progress of what you are doing. <laughs> Benjamin? Oh, that's an interesting one. I would say don't trust the machine. Never trust the machine. Always press Alt uh, Control S. Um, I was going to say um, the whatever screenshot button there is. So when something goes wrong, you can send that to someone to 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 say there's something wrong. But I, w I will actually finish by saying I think Alt, Alt F4 is probably the most important one because it's important just to take a break sometimes. <laughs> close your computer, close the application, take a break, go outside. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Well, on that uh, that note, that brings us to the perfect end of our panel. Let's just have a look at the the poll um, and. Oh, well, actually, yeah, we've got three results that are more or less the same. So more subtitling audio descriptions, more language options pairings, and more software functionalities for disabled translators. And then regional dialects, people obviously don't think that's quite as important, and also the hardware as well. Uh, thank you for voting. That's very, very interesting. Um, and I would like to thank our speakers for a really interesting panel. Uh, we have Bogdan, Fred, Birgit and Benjamin. Please give them a big round of applause. <laughs> and you are now free to leave the stage and we are going to move on to the next panel. Thank you very much thank you. indeed. Thank you. Bye.